Yeah, welcome everyone to the Strategy Maps, a visualization practice to connect your roadmap by Craig Coburn. Uh, Craig Coburn is uh, a freelance enterprise agile coach and his main top topics mostly would be critical thinking, visualizing strategy, visualizing talks and remote working. He's uh, currently working on his next initiative called unbiasedagile.com. So we can also have a look at it. So without any further delay, I'm just handing over to Craig Coburn. Welcome, Craig. Once again. Thanks thank for you. the intro and, and um, thanks to everybody who's joined. We're 33 people. So thank you everybody for your time and joining my talk. So this is visualizing the why, why of movement, strategy and roadmaps and context. So this is about agile strategy in a complex landscape and a new practice that I call strategy maps. So there's a, a, a my, my contact details are there. Obviously I'll be available after the talk uh, at the desk for uh, mingling and chat. My two main URLs are craigcoburn.com and my new one, which has just been mentioned, unbiasedagile.com, which is about avoiding frameworks and looking more to practices to um, get better collaboration. I'm on Twitter, there's a, there's a hashtag as well. And I am, in fact, distantly related to Agile, Alistair, uh, the, one of the co-authors of the Agile Manifesto. The, the key audience for this talk I see is, is basically everybody. Um, one of the things I address here is that often strategy is reserved for senior leaders, board directors, all these sorts of things. But I say that everybody should have an interest in strategy just like everybody should have an interest in customers or quality. The more people that are involved, the more insights you get. And, and so really this is trying to be much more inclusive, open and transparent and in line with many of the practices in Agile about making stuff visible to get feedback and alignment. And it matters to all of us because we'll see later in this talk what happens when strategy goes wrong. So this is the kind of outline of, of this talk, the format and flavour of it. Uh, I'll introduce some concepts and terms, I'll explain why it matters. I'll work through a really, really complex example that, that proves this practice works in very complex situations. And then I'll take you through a simple example, the template, some supporting practices, with some key takeaways, and then there's time for questions at the end. Now, this is how I do my talks. Um, this is roughly the format of the talk, and I will fill this in as I go so that you can see where you're at in the talk, what we've covered, and it gives you a chance to consolidate your knowledge as we go. Uh, this is my alternative format, which is like a mind map, but you'll see that unfold as it goes to, to prompt you over what we've covered, what we've learned, and the key topics. So you don't have to remember it all in one go. Appreciating a conference is a lot of content, and I'm trying to assist you here by making it easier to remember. So first of all, the story of where this came from is um, I was looking at Simon Wardley's mapping techniques, which are linked to strategy, which are very good. I was listening to Roman Pischler and I hosted him for a talk on roadmaps and he mentioned strategy and that was very good. But rather than just talking about the concept, I couldn't quite see for the team I was working with at the time, how we could actually get strategic thinking. You know, How do we take a Simon Wardley uh, map and make it real for us so that we know what to do first and next? Or how do we get beyond just talking about strategy to actually get implementable steps? So what this talk does is it tries to kind of take both of those things and add to them. So I'm not detracting from those talks at all. It builds on them, but it connects them up. Because to me, this solved the problem of me being able to talk to my team in a way that made sense to them, so that became actionable strategy. Now, I'll explain a bit about why maps matter, because that's one theme of the talk, and why making things visible matters. This is a, a, an ancient battle um, about two and a half thousand years ago, and if you look in the right, the traditional project management approach of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, versus an actual map, a, a map that shows what's going on when, and this was, you know, block the sea, which then causes the army to fight on the land. There is a narrow point on the land, therefore that diminishes the strategic advantage. Therefore, 
their, their, their advantage of numbers is then reduced. So you can see what's going on, when it's happening, and why. Whereas on the right-hand side, strength, weakness, is opportunity, threat, so what? Where do you start? It's just a list, right? So, and, and you know, if you think about corporate strategy, be, well, let's be the leading army, or let's win three battles this year, or this, this. It's just like, it's a list. We need to get away from lists to actionable plans. And this is what Simon Wardley uses in his talk to explain why maps matter and visualizations. Now, just because I'm from Scotland, I've got a Scottish example, which is particularly relevant because in the Battle of Bannockburn in the 14th century, the Scottish army defeated an English army that was more than double their size. And they did so using an effective strategy. Now, that strategy is in six points there, but it's like, the, that's what they did, that's why they did it, and that's the order that they did it in. And it incorporated the land, the battle landscape, and situational tactics. But importantly as well, this battle was only two days long and was a decisive victory. So let's get away from just thinking the strategy is just for big multi-year things. A strategy can be just for two days, be decisive and have effects that ripple down centuries later, not just years or decades. The Agile Manifesto was written in two days. You know, and it's affected the whole world, right? So strategy is not just for big things. Strategy is for anything that, that you, you want to really make a meaningful difference. And you need to think carefully about how you approach the problem. So this is, we covered the intro and that's some key topics in the intro. You know, this is me and how to talk and raise it. And this is some things that I've just covered. So you get this develop as we go through the talk. So first of all, now, why is strategy a problem? First of all, we don't always use the same words to mean the same things. Organizational jargon, agile jargon, organizations just invent their own meanings for things, and it means different things to different people. So in this talk, these are the key words I use, and this is what they mean. And hopefully that's not too different from what you think they mean, but sometimes I see disagreements of what's an outcome, what's a whatever. So that, that's my definition. The strategy is a context-specific plan to deliver outcomes. And the delivery of outcomes supports you in realizing the vision, the direction you're aiming towards. And yeah, you can have different ways of realizing that through tactics. But if you have a vision, you know where you should head towards, therefore what outcomes then support that. Now, traditional uh, other definitions you might hear, um, I won't use them so much here, but in the broader agile world, you know, we sometimes talk about um, you know, you know, key results and whatever else like that. So there's some related terms here for, for definition. Of course, you'll get the slides afterwards. So if you feel a bit overburdened by content, don't worry. The slides are relatively standalone. I'm available for questions afterwards, but I try to make it so that there's a lot of info in the slides so you don't get stuck. With jargon. Now, Peter Drucker, well, this is a quote, isn't it? Culture eats strategy for breakfast. Let's start with debunking a few common myths. First of all, he didn't say that. There is no evidence at all Peter Drucker said that, but he's often attributed at it because we're guilty of just cut and paste. I heard it on a chat, I saw it on LinkedIn, I heard it at a talk, oh, therefore it must be true, right? And often we're just guilty of just reciting what other people say without going back to the source. So there's the data, check the links. Peter Drucker did not say it, but actually more importantly, what I think is that actually they're not competing, they're complementary. have both, right? Their culture helps your strategy. I mean, if you don't have a good culture, your strategy will be difficult to implement, but if you have a great culture and no strategy, well, where are you gonna go, right? So, so think about both. And this is what I say is like, just copying what other people do without context, implementing a framework, it's maybe not the right framework. You need to understand the situation and the problem that you are trying to solve. And see in this picture, there's a bridge that looks like it's in the sea. Well, actually that's a very useful bridge, even though it looks rather ridiculous because this picture was taken at high tide. Now, when it's not high tide, there's a beach on the other side, there's a car park on this side, and there is a river flows underneath that bridge. So the bridge helps you to get from the car park to the lovely beach. 
At high tide, of course, everything's underwater, so the beach is unavailable and the bridge looks out of context. But in context, that bridge is very useful. This is the wrong context for it because it's high tide. But this is an example of when we use the wrong, the, what looks useful in the wrong context can turn out to be useless. And, and here we have something that looks useless, but actually turns out to be useful. So this is why we need to think carefully about things. Is this the right thing for this situation and not just a big template that we're trying to copy? Now, strategic failures, a few classic examples here. I'm sure the list is really long. I just picked four. But these four, you know, are important because we still have cameras, but Kodak's not really around anymore. We still watch films, but Blockbuster's not really around anymore. We still buy phones. Nokia's still around. It's still a pretty big company, but it's a fraction of what it used to be. And we still buy toys. But So these are four companies that have effectively gone bust or significantly reduced or been disrupted, even though the business they operate in is still a big thing. So it's not like we're talking about the manufacturers of fax machines. Um, that way, that, that's not really been a thing. We're talking about multi-million pound markets where people got disrupted out of them because they had poor strategies. And I just heard a comment in the COVID era that Nokia used to make respirators. And you know that's an example of a business that has pivoted massively over the amount of time it's been around. But still, you know, they got caught out and they focused really much on mobile phones and didn't really see what was coming. Um, now, I'll also talk about Brexit. Um, for those of you who don't know what that is, it was a thing in 2016 and was the process for Britain leaving the EU. Now, that had never happened before. Nobody had ever left. And it was a complex mess. And nobody really knew what was happening next. The public voted for something that wasn't specified. Oh, there's uh, legal challenges left, right and centre. It effectively rewrote part of the British uh, unwritten constitution. It was a total mess. So I will use this example of that mess to show even in a mess, you can actually make sense of it. Now, some data. Um, you can refer to these sites to look it up, but you know, 97% of 10,000 executives said strategy was the most critical thing. And yet the reality says otherwise, right? So this is from the Agile uh, Business Agility Report in 2018. And what it says is that it's the biggest challenge. Now, um, there is unclear and changing vision, which I touched on earlier, and about leadership. So key themes here. Now, that was four years ago. Let's just wind through to three years ago. Oh, it's, it's, it's exactly the same, right? Um, nothing changed there in a year, same quote, same problems. 2020, well, they rephrased it, still the same problems. And we're seeing this all over the place, that a lack of good strategy and leadership is one of the key reasons that address transformations don't really work very well. A leader sets the tone for the entire organisation. I'm talking about servant leadership, but actually being the leader, acting like the leader, being like David Marquet, all these people out there. Leadership's really critical, right? And the styles and behaviours are more consistent with legacy culture. Um, I did write this up as a fuller article where you can look at other data that I've gathered, like from the State of Agile report and others, but really is bringing out the theme of a lot of it is about poor strategy or lack of leadership. So that's me looking at the problem and some corporate failures and seeing what's going on in the past and why strategy really matters. Now, strategy in Agile, Oh, this is a PI planning board that I did uh, um, a few years ago. I mean, look at the number of tickets. It's just like, where do you start? It's just complex, right? Now, talk about Scaled Agile Framework briefly, and I mention it because as a framework, and look at all the documentation, and look at all the courses, and look at the fact in particular that SAFE really aims itself as being a top to bottom full organizational thing, you know, right from executives, at multi layers and multi levels of the organization. Yet, SAFE quotes this and, and states the same problem I've just done is that e executives talk at cross purposes. And there's, a, like, and there's not really a good alignment. But, but I say, even SAFE that deals with this whole organization of transformation and strategy, it's, it, its wording on it is quite light. So even SAFE doesn't go into this in much detail. It just says, yeah, we want to be able to change quickly. Well, isn't that just agile, right? It's not really a strategy. That's just what agile is talking about. 
And um, so I'll say talks about alignment and transparency. So I'm kind of building on those themes as well. Strategic agility is the ability to change and implement new strategies. I mean, it feels like a recursive definition. But nonetheless, here's a diagram, and I'm sure that's got all the answers. That's what SAFE says, look, we've kind of bent the journey a little bit. That's not really helping, it's just a picture. It doesn't tell you what to do or how to do it, and you can check out the links yourself. So just bringing in, as mentioned earlier, talking about Roman Pitchler, and he talked about strategy. This is what he talked about, and this starts to connect things up. So I mentioned about vision earlier, where you're trying to get to, your ultimate end state. The product strategy supports that. Therefore, with that strategy, you can then understand then what goes into your roadmap that then supports the strategy. And therefore, with that roadmap, which is your near-term goals, maybe like six to nine months, key, key things that you're delivering, you then develop the product backlog in support of the near-term things in the roadmap. So there's a sense of lining things up here. Yeah, so then you get a connected organization. That's great, but it's still missing the detail. So now I'll just dip over to Simon Wardley for a bit to introduce you to that. And he talks about the strategy cycle. Now, this cycle starts here at the game, which is why bother at all? You know, so this is like, if you're not playing chess, right? So think about chess. Why play chess? You know, you might enjoy it. You might be competitive. You might meet friends. Why bother at all? Right? That's the why of purpose. Why are we doing this thing at all? When you've decided it is a valuable thing to do, then you get into the why of movement. And what is an optimal move in chess depends on the board that is before you at that time. So therefore it must be context sensitive. So this is looking at the landscape, the climate, and then using doctrine and then leadership. So landscape is generally things that don't change much. You just have to accept them. Climate is things that do change. I'll give you some examples in a minute. And doctrine is good practices that you can then layer on top of what's going on to then use leadership to decide and be visible in what you're doing. This is um, what Simon Ward calls the strategy cycle and it's closely related to Sun Tzu, uh, The Art of War, uh, Chinese uh, manual, and also John Boyd's OODA loop, uh, Observe, Orient, Decide, Act. John Boyd was an, a US Air Force uh, pilot um, just after the Second World War and wrote about strategy and said, basically the people that can come work through this cycle the quickest in, in an aerial battle are then going to be in a better position to then you know, be able to attack their enemy and likely to be more successful. There are supporting practices, there's a big list here, that can help you to align that to what you should be doing at particular times. So that's there for your reference. Um, a bit more relatable to agile stuff about user needs and context and map. Um, but that's, that's largely there for your reference after the talk to show how this map can relate to agile activities. There's a lot more on Simon Wardley's site. But what's, what is often missing is to tell the story and to bring the people on the journey so they are committed and they are involved and they are interested and they see the bigger picture. But often what is missing in strategies that I've seen and worked in a lot of big organizations, the strategies just become to-do lists. We're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this. We hold these values, whatever it is, it's just a to-do list. And when I use this talk and make it longer and ask people in polls, do you have a strategy? How often is it updated? And does it really matter? The, the results are pretty mixed, to be honest. It's like often a chief executive comes in, builds a new strategy, it doesn't change for months or years, and it's just a bit of a to-do list, and people don't know what's going on when. But the important thing is, as I mentioned in those businesses earlier that went bust, they went bust because of what their competitors did. And having a strategy without saying what your competitors will do means that that doesn't get talked about enough. So by making your competitive strategy visible, you will then see what you need to do to undermine your opponent. It's like playing chess, right? You can see where your board's pieces all are and your opponent's pieces. So therefore you know what to do to undermine your opponent. Just having a to-do list, it's like, well, so what? Are we talking about our, our competitors enough? 
And are we seeing what they would do when? So we need to know the, the uh, need to act soon. And as I, say, as I said before, capital charter is not mutually exclusive. And also half of the Agile manifesto values, despite it being the manifesto for software, half of the values are about people. Individuals and interactions is the first one, and customer collaboration is the third one. So let's just bring the focus back to people rather than process. And let's also make sure that we update in line with feedback and changing circumstances, because as we've seen recently, we've had Brexit, we've had COVID, you know, we've had Donald Trump, we've had Boris Johnson. I mean, just like there's, there's been so much going on recently. We need to update things, not only when we anticipate things will change, but also when things change around us. So let's not have it as a fossilized slide deck that sits there for five years and becomes increasingly redundant. Touch a little bit on psychology here. Um, this is from Ian McLaren Morris, who won a, an award um, for excellence in business psychology. And in order to get that leadership in acting, the leaders need to process the knowledge. It's changing all around us. Things are becoming new, they're unfamiliar. You know, they are unknown. So to acquire that knowledge to, for it to become familiar and to acquire that knowledge so it becomes known and then to process that emergent knowledge so we then know what to do with it. It's like learning a language. You need to get good enough at processing and assimilating the knowledge to order to know then to act. So, you know, we have to accept that humans are like this. We have to be able to incorporate and synthesize lots of different evolving bits of knowledge. And, and this is the landscape that we work in. So in order to act, we need to have processed enough information or to include enough complexity and to accept the people, that people are at different stages and their learning journeys in order to know what to do in a complex landscape. So now let's work through Brexit and see what happened. Now, this is, we went back to the strategy cycle. And this is like saying, well, Perhaps people had motives for why Brexit or why they weren't supporting Brexit. Let's understand a bit of the context. Yeah, that's some suggested context there. But then the landscape there was, you know, there was competing groups that were always going to be competing. There were fractured groups that was always going to be fractured. There was no clear majority in parliament. These are just things that just had to work with. So this is like the courage to accept the things that you cannot change and the wisdom to accept the things you can. This is don't try changing the things you can't change. But some people were able to say, well, what can we change, right? So what was going on is the clock was running down, we're running out of legislative time. The, the government you know, expelled people from the party and lost its majority. There was court action from the Supreme Court, which changed what the government could do. These were dynamic, right? And these are the things that could change and also propaganda and misinformation were on the go. So this was affecting what could then happen next. Now, somebody tried to draw this out as a bit of a flowchart, but this is what led me to be inspired that this actually works. Now, I'm not going to bore you with the tedious polit political detail here. There's just too much, but you can see from the plate of spaghetti before you, there is a lot going on. But importantly, the key things here, top, the, the red, yellow, green, indicates kind of where the, uh, it's going in line with different types of outcome. And at the bottom, um, the processing tells you the relative likelihoods. Now, this is just one person put it together using feedback, publishing it, getting feedback, and built this. And it proved to be amazingly accurate. So here is a map going from April to autumn. It was only like three, four months, right? Because things were changing so quickly. Things were changing on a daily basis or a weekly basis. It was changing massively, and nobody knew what was happening. And everybody was just wanting their thing without saying, why or how, or is that realistic or is it just a fringe opinion? This brought it to life to say, this is what's gonna happen next and why, and this is what your opponents will do next and why. And through that, it proved to be a reliable source of information. So what I just did is turn that map on its side so it became a timeline, and then I looked at the outcomes. And then I started to score those outcomes in terms of, well, if you wanted this one, what would that mean that you would need to do? And then say, well, let's now start with that, work backwards. So what now are the preceding steps? What are the preceding steps for your opponents? What might they do next? 
What do you need to block or make less likely? Or where do you need to change? Or what do you need to do to make your pathway more likely to succeed? So as I talk about red team thinking, there's practices underlining that. that um, there's practices such as um, pre-mortem by Dr. Gary Klein, which is to consider failure, then to work backwards to say, how far along that path are we really? We start talking about that early before it became too late, like Brockbuster, it was too late. Nokia, it was too late. The earlier we see what the opponent will do, the earlier we can act. So now you can devise a context-specific flexible strategy. I'll show it in the next one. But this to me is what agility is really about. It's not just about reacting to stuff like Safe talks about. It's about being proactive, about seeing what could happen. Where do we need multiple pathways? Should we have two or three or even more? Like when they're developing a COVID vaccine, they developed multiple in parallel. That's a strategy, not one at a time. Some, you know, it's about how do you approach the problem and what could go wrong in discussing that earlier. That's proactive, it's not happened yet, but you're preparing for it and you're developing an approach that meets the situation. So by turning this diagram inside, I then did this. Now, the, the colors on the right are the outcomes that are referenced here. So imagine the two green ones at the top. There's one green one there, which is actually works its way through the diagram in a funny way. And there's another green one up here that then works through there. So you can then work out the preceding steps. But you can also see what your opponents might do. And from this, I, I, I then um, took the, the, the green outcomes and worked backwards to say, what does that tell me should happen? And one should, says, get an extension to the time scale, buy some time, and uh, involve uh, a people's vote and secure that and win it. That's one. But there's also another one that's more risky because the diagram says so. And therefore, this strategy fits into this diagram to meet these outcomes and you can see what your opponents will do so you can sense and measure that as well. And this is for a, a, a complex, messy situation changing daily or weekly. Now, likely a good in business is that you're not dealing with that level of change, but this was highly complex, highly uh, movable, breaking new legislative ground, and yet this worked because you're seeing a later the evidence, right? So really the, the points in this diagram start going towards the outcomes. You look what you're doing, you see what your opponents are doing, you see roughly if that likely or not and what do you do to shift the odds. Now, of course, you must update this. It is not a fixed event. You must update it when something has changed or you reach a point where, you know, we, we, you know, we need to reflect and adapt because we're now at a different point. So. You know, this is about constant sensing and adapting and making it visual so everybody can then contribute feedback, be involved, add their wisdom, and you get collective buy-in, and also the wisdom of everybody in the room, rather than just the select few with a select opinion, given their select opinions and, and a very narrow focus, right? Which is often what happens with strategy. It's you know, people in their 50s, you know, with a particular background to come up with strategy, rather than encompassing the wisdom of the whole organization. This worked. So these were published in real time on Twitter. You can go back and see them. And series two said there would be a delay. That actually happened. Series three foresaw a general election. That's what actually happened. And series four showed the deal we get. And that's what actually happened. And you can see the data. So despite you tune in the news and you just get loads and loads of people with conflicting opinions, wanting this and wanting that, and not articulating anything, this did the analysis, and through this analysis, you could work out what was likely to happen. Therefore, if that wasn't what you wanted, you could then do something different. The, the press and UK just ignored this largely, but it was massively covered by the foreign media, and it demonstrates the value of critical analysis and it working in a complex decision-making and basing our decision-making as much as possible on facts rather than opinions. And yeah, well, yeah, do uncover inconvenient truths, but this is what matters. This is the real world. It's not just about what people want. It's about the realism of achieving it based on competing aims. So that's the, the recap of this particular section showing the inspiration for strategy maps. And then I took that to make a template from it, 
you can use yourselves. Uh, so I'll take that on and I'll show you this in a minute. So applying this approach, that's the template I then came up with. Now, if you're using this yourself, you take away a lot of this text here. It's just there as a placeholder to show you. But how this works is, is it drew on that previous flowchart where it's time to the left to the right, and it was about what you're trying to achieve. So there's the outcomes you're trying to achieve. You've made them visible. There's the vision you're trying to get to. You've made it visible. But this is the situational context. You make that visible too. Now, the key thing here is you're also making what your competitor's vision is and what they are trying to achieve so you make that visible as well. Now, if you think of this a little bit like a football field, um, the neutral is just playing in the middle of the pitch. Playing in your opponent's half is good, it's useful. And if you watch sport and TV, you'll see them doing the analysis of who's got possession, where it is, whether it's tennis, whether it's golf, whether it's anything else. It's like, yeah, is, the, is this team doing well? Are they holding on? Have they got possession? Right? That's a tactical advantage because you're unlikely to score from your own half. Right? This is an early sign of success, but the embedded gains are only when you actually score an actual goal. Like that's what gets you the, the win. Right? And you must score more goals than your competition. Right? But, but the embedded gains are different. They're not tactical advantages. They're actual advantages. And in the world of strategy, I see these are two different things. Now, you can align this to safe. This is about an enabler, and this is about a feature. Right? So this is internal capability, which you need to support you. And this is external games, real customers, real money in the bank. Right? They're different, but you need both. You, know, you can't ship 10 million iPhones unless you have a factory, but well, the factory is your internal capability. Right? So both matter, but if you're jumping straight to there, which is often what happens, you go, well, there's no realism in this plan. It's missing. Now, the, so this is the different strategy is non-linear, but you need both the internal work and you need the external work. But the problem is, although the external work, like the delivery of an iPhone or the scoring of a goal or the launch of a product, great. There's money in the bank, there's customers, there's feedback. You've established the market. You're maybe the market leader. But guess what? As soon as you put that out the door, everybody then starts to copy you. So there's disadvantages. It's a different landscape you're working in. You've just changed it by having a product. So this is what happened. Apple launched the iPhone, and then Android copied it right? because it was public. And this is why strategy is non-linear. There's internal stuff that you need, and there's external stuff which is valuable, but then it's prone to being copied. And again, this is true for your competitors too. So if they launch something, you can copy them. And how this works is you, usually you start in the bottom left-hand corner in the now, in a position of disadvantage, which you've made clear, to work to embedded outcomes up here in the future that support your favorable outcomes in your vision. But generally, the trend in this diagram is from bottom left to top right, but it's non-linear, right? So I'll show you a quick example from real life. I was in an organization, they wanted to be agile. They had some old job roles like project manager and stuff and whatever else, you know, all of the old stuff that they had with Waterfall. They wanted to develop new roles, uh, articulate what those roles were for, align people to those roles, and then with product owners and scrum masters and uh, release train engineers, all that stuff, we'd be transformed, right? That was their roadmap concept, right? And, you know, that's, that's a typical way we lay out a roadmap. It's just linear. There's no failure scenario there. It's just one after another, after another, after another. So what could go wrong here? Well, I mapped that roadmap onto a strategy map, and that's what it looks like. So there's a, a position of disadvantage with the old job roles, the legacy roles. You're doing some internal capability. You've now rolled it out, and look, you're transformed. Right? That's what that would look like on a diagram like this. However. The reality was like that. And of course, that didn't appear in the original diagram. That's why failure is not an option. Well, it's hard to say, but actually, failure is always an option. Um, you just might not like to talk about it. But what happened is they rolled out the roles, and then people were worried about their jobs. They say, do I have a position in this? Are they going to get rid of people? I don't like this new agile stuff. I might be without a job. I'm quite happy and secure. I've been here a long time. Um, I'm not bought into this. 
fear and distrust set in. And of course, then the problem is that if, the more you plow on with this without getting people's buy-in, you then get entrenched resistance, which then may well lead to failure because it's just had too long to bed in. And that's a real problem. So this is a bit more like the reality. You know, let's pilot the rules. Let's get a group pilot. Let's see how that goes. Let's expand it. Or if it doesn't work, we'll change the approach. So you can see divergent pathways here. You can see what's going to happen. You can check this plan for excessive optimism. Wait a minute, that's excessive optimism. It's too big a leap in one go. Right, so experiments are valuable because you've got excessive optimism. So this is more like the reality. And it's, again, I'm making failure obvious, but this is the roadmap. Like that's your additional roadmap, but you're still making other options visible and having them ready just in case you need them. Because there's your plan B, just in case you need it. You might need to prepare that plan B early. If like Brexit, there's maybe like a low probability of success at the first attempt. So when you get your plan B, or if you get a plan B, is dependent on the riskiness of the situation you're dealing with. So this is the strategy, the roadmap, and the plan B all in one place. Now, obviously, you can have a bigger diagram. You can have smaller things on the diagram. This is just a really simple example to show you how it works. But it's like it makes everything visible. I've got the trying to do agile transformation on the left, where you're at, you know, what the outcomes are. Are you constantly in line with that? Are you constantly supporting this? And, you know, let's talk about failure. If you fail, your great people might leave and work for your competition. You clearly don't want that to happen. So what are you doing to stop it? Right. So you don't want your competitors to benefit from your failure. Make it visible. Get everybody's buy-in. Get alignment. So there's lots of supporting practices that will help you. And I've listed them here. There's lots of other references to go to. You know, I can't cover all of them in a talk of this length, but... There are many ways that you could develop this approach. Um, I've just listed a few of them here. But really a good understanding of the present problem really matters, because unless you know where you're at, the, the solutions that you say might not be relevant. If I was going to go to India, it would matter if I was starting from Edinburgh or if I was starting from India, right? Um, and Kinefin, you know, talking this briefly um, about managing complex situations. So, here, this is the land of the more complex it is, the more parallelism you are likely to need, because Scrum just tends to work in this green space up here, between complicated complex. More complex it is, the more parallelism is valid, and the more quicker sensor networks you need. Whereas if it's complicated, it's more predictable. If it's clear, it's very predictable. So it's not like saying Agile is always complex. The whole Agile space incorporates a whole load of different work. So it's the nature of each type of situation you encounter that defines how, how you approach and plan for it. Highly complex may need different options. Complicated may need fewer options and, and some experts. The clear might just be, well, we don't need any options because we know what we're doing. So you can indicate on the map your understanding of how complex you think that part of the map is, which then guides whether you've got enough optionality in your map diagram. Um, if you Google started that, you might come across an earlier talk. This is by the professor at Harvard. Um, it's been a thing, thing for a while. This was done about 20 years ago before Agile and it's quite oriented towards the thinking then. Um, it's largely about you know, balance scorecard and stuff. But this has been a thing for a while. But this, doesn't, this is just in case you come across it. And that's the reference from Harvard Business Review. So it's been to be important for a long time. And loads of people have worked on this. And I'm trying to use agile thinking, transparency, and openness to get better collaboration rather than just telling people what to do. Uh, I've touched on red team thinking a little bit. This is a set of practices originally from the military that's now being increasingly used in business. There's a mention of it here in Mike Cohen's blog from two years ago. And what they do is a thing called string of perils. And it's bringing out assumptions, challenging them, and looking at second or third order dependencies. So that if we do this, what might then arise? What, what might then evolve? Because particularly in the military, if you make a mistake, it's very difficult to take back. And um, so they have practices of, of critical thinking to try and assess like chess, 
if we were to do this, what could then unfold? So where could it go wrong? Um, but again, you can look at that. It's, it's, all, it's all in the open, just because it's a military site. It's freely available. And you can read more there. Um, so what I say is, well, uh, I, I, let's have effective roadmaps. First of all, this is from Comic Adrail saying, well, I hope in our Adrail release train that we don't have to actually change direction because we can't. That's not a thing that trains are very good at generally. And, and so let's not do that. And also, this is a really good viral tweet that came about a couple of years ago to say, look, it's picking up on what I had said there. It's like misleading roadmaps are just one step after another. Honest roadmaps are more like forecasting a hurricane, like Dan Vacanti says. It shows uncertainty. It shows that things become increasingly unpredictable the further ahead you go. It shows about planning to a realistic horizon, like a hurricane. There's people forecasting hurricanes, they've got PhDs and doctorates and professorships, but they still only forecast hurricanes a few days or a week in advance, because further doesn't add value. It's too uncertain. So planning to an appropriate horizon and then have a strategic roadmap. Like my diagram, this came after my talk and he just says there's options. What I do is rank the options so you can see are you improving or not. So we're talking about similar things here. Um, I first gave this talk in 2019. Um, he's better at graphics than I, so his um, social media reach is, is a bit bigger because it's a bit catchier. But we're saying the same thing. This is a more realistic view of the world. This isn't, this is just dishonest, right? And, you know, 6,000 likes, and that was a couple of years ago. It's probably gone up since then. So this is what I've done about showing you the proposal. And I now just do a bit of a recap because I realize I've taught you quite a lot and covered quite a lot of ground. I'll just bring in Wardy Maps again because I mentioned that at the start to say, if you have a Wardy Map, what they do is visualize movement, often in relation to value stream and often in relation to technical maturity patterns like new products, then it becomes a com well, commodity and utility and so on. So the product life cycle. They visualize that and that's very useful to understand what to do. So then if you know what to do, you can then put it on to one of my maps to then say in what order and why and what might the competitors do. So this is a very complementary practice toward the maps um, and it works well and takes them further. Let's say the maps are often about technicality and products and I'm talking in more general sense about organizations. Uh, as I see, this is a visualization practice, like a Kanban board, like an impact map, simply a visualization practice to bring out the right conversations. Uh, and I, as this diagram, I, I sort of see that there's three parts to Agile. There's the leadership part, we don't often talk about enough. There's actual agility, which is thinking ahead and responding. And there's lean, which is just about improving some stuff. That's just about eliminating waste. There's three aspects here to Agile. And we often just talk about the bottom two, and we kind of neglect leadership because we see from state of agile surveys that it's a continuing problem. But also visualize the circle as being, it's all underpinned by people. If you don't have people on the journey, if you don't involve the customer, if you don't involve your employees, they become disenchanted and they leave. So let's not, not just talk about the process, agility or lean, let's talk about the people and involve them too, you know, invite by, Invite them in rather than force them. Involve them rather than tell them. All these things matter. So it's kind of like a four-way four thing to be effective. Some supporting steps to do here. I mean, this is in the slide that you can take that away. But again, key things is there's probably more to it than this, but this is just some that I picked out about visibility, openness, avoiding to-do lists and so on, and constant reflection. But just to kind of sum up and, and help you with some takeaways, to, to, to kind of bring together the benefits of this approach over to-do lists and PowerPoints and PDFs and static lists. There's 12 things that I noted that are visible in my map that are probably not visible in the strategies you've currently got. Why are you doing it? What, what problem are you trying to solve? Are you on track or are you going off track? You know, okay, I'll kind of help with that too. What your tactics are for getting there and, and why. The use of multiple routes, which roadmaps often don't show. Uh, avoiding pitfalls, which most people don't talk about. The state of complexity, therefore what part of Kinefin is most relevant for you. What your opponents might do. 
I mean, there's just like a long list here. I just see that maybe not all 12 are relevant to you, but even if one's relevant, I've helped you, right? And that's the main thing. So that's kind of recap there. Um, I mentioned here uh, briefly crossing over a feeling stone. So that's the time we've already talked about this incremental crossing by assessing where you're going, evaluating, then deciding the next step rather than it all being predictable. Hopefully I've covered all of this. So now just kind of the last stages, a couple of books to suggest, a couple of links to follow. I've written and blogged about this a little bit more. I've you know, done, done this talk a few times now. I brought up a bit of a blog on it. There's other things to read that are in the space like Kinefin. Um, and uh, Declaration of Independence was by Alistair Coburn, Heart of Agile by Alistair Coburn. They're not frameworks. And what I'm trying to do is move people away from frameworks because frameworks often constrain your thinking. And basically that's, that's time up and thank you. And any questions and any feedback? And, and while I do the questions and feedback, there's the talk. So all you have to do is look at this to prompt you as to what you'd like to ask me about. Thanks, Greg. I think uh, it was a nice session. I think all, I hope uh, uh, all the participants uh, now know how to do it effectively. Yeah, oh, well, there's one question I just see. Somebody says, do we need strategy team program portfolio level? And I'd say, yes, everybody should be thinking about strategy. But whatever you're doing, it should all just line up. I like OKRs kind of line up to form a coherent purpose here, aiming to the same thing. But what you do is relevant to you. I mean, think about sprint plan. That's a strategy for the successful execution of a sprint. Think of it as, the, as your two-week strategy for successfully delivering the sprint goal. Right, so of course you need different strategies, but they need to be coherent. They need to not conflict with one another and they need to be aligned to the bigger picture and the vision. Thanks once again, Greg. Thanks all the participants. Mm -hmm.